So uh, basically today I'm going to be talking about TX Probe, which is our technique to infer the topology of the Bitcoin network and all our um, Bitcoin forks that use the same uh, kind of a structure using orphan transactions and double spending transactions. So as um, I would introduce, I'm now working on piece of research doing uh, um, work on layer two. Uh, what's ours basically, but that was like part of my work with my PhD. So in a nutshell, what we are going to be talking about today is like, how can we reconstruct uh, the topology of the network only using transactions, right? There's been like other work using network messages and so on, uh, but all this kind of work has been patched over the years. So let me start by talking about what do we know about the topology? When we are talking about topology, we're basically talking about graphs. Um, and there's some information out there that we can check in the Bitcoin network specifically. So basically what we can know about is the number of nodes and the location of them. And we can use like nice websites like Bitcoin nodes or something like that to see how many nodes we can account, at least uh, the reachable nodes, right? But if we are talking about graphs, uh, there's something here that is clearly missing, and those are the edges. And the reason why this is missing uh, is because they have chosen to do it uh, by design, right? They don't want the people to know about the topology for privacy reasons, and we are going to be discussing those. Um, then why would you choose to like, have a hidden topology? Well, the thing is that if you have an open topology, then you can have uh, attackers that, are, uh, that have like, an, an easier time trying to do some kind of attacks, like transaction de-anonymization, so like how to um, uh, check if the first relayer of a transaction is actually the creator of the transaction, or uh, more powerful network attacks, like Eclipse attacks. So basically how to isolate one uh, node from the network, and then being able to like, do some like, nasty stuff, like sending double spending transactions to them without them uh, noticing about it, or like, even if you're powerful enough, mining uh, blocks on top of like, the, the current uh, chain, and like, basically like, mess around with the division of the blockchain for that node. So that's basically why the current approach of the core is to hide this. Uh, and so there's no kind of like network message that you can use in order to like get who is connected to who, right? You can like get information about like the nodes that are, are around with like others messages and so on, but that information doesn't contain who has been connected to who or uh, yeah, basically. So what, what's like the neighborhood of every node? On the flip side, what would you choose to have an open topology? So why have we done this kind of analysis? Well, the fact that you have a closed topology and you don't have any information about the network, it's fine if you want to prevent these kind of things, but also uh, prevent you from knowing what's going on in the network. So for example, we don't know if there's like any kind of network uh, centralization in there. We don't know like uh, if there are super nodes in the network that may be controlling some of the traffic. Uh, if some nodes are uh, withholding information, if there's censorship in the network, um, regarding to eclipse attacks, we don't know if there are, there's eclipse attacks going on right now. We don't know if there are parts of the network that are more likely to be isolated because uh, they are not properly connected. So there's like a lot of things we don't know. Like all this information is, is obscured and it doesn't look, seems like the, the way to go to build a uh, decentralized uh, cryptocurrency on top of, right? We are relaying in this network whether we like it or not. So in terms of design, we know a little bit more. And how they achieve this kind of like uh, privacy in a network layer is by choosing things uh, randomly, or pseudo randomly at least, when you bootstrap your node. So how this works is like when you bootstrap your node, you choose uh, some of the peers you're going to connect to from your address man or your list of, of peers. And then what you do is that you choose eight outbound connections, so connections you create to other peers. Uh, in a way that none of them is inside the same slash uh, 16 IPv4 group. So basically what you are trying to achieve here is that no single party can control your view, your view of the network. On top of that, your node is going to accept 117 connections, uh, ingoing connections by default, and those are not uh, going to have any kind of restriction. So all this applies to Bitcoin core implementation. Different implementations have different uh, approaches, but uh, this is like the... the, the um, the fact the standard of uh, Bitcoin implementation, so what people normally use. So, um, I was saying that our technique is based on, transa uh, on transactions, only transactions, and in order to understand how this works, we need a little bit of background. First, in transaction propagation, and then in two specific kind of transactions, which are orphans and double spending. 
So we are going to go uh, through this first and then explain the technique. So in terms of transaction propagation, how does this work? So when, your node, when you create a transaction in your node, or when your node receives one transaction, if all the checks pass, so basically your transaction is correct, that transaction goes to mempool. Uh, and after sitting there for a while, that transaction is going to be propagated through a network, right? Um, then basically what you're trying to achieve is like sending that to, uh, to your neighborhood, so they send it through, through their neighborhood and so on and so forth, and eventually you reach the miners and your transaction gets into a block, right? So this works in a pretty uh, easy three-step uh, protocol, which uh, works as follows. The first thing you do is you announce your transaction. And in order to do this, you use an inventory message, including the hash of the transaction. Then if the peer you're trying to send this information to wants it, basically because he doesn't have it, then what uh, he's going to do or he, what it's going to do is to send you a get data message containing the same transaction hash, saying basically, hey, I'm interested in this because I don't have it and I want to have it, right? So that's going to trigger a two-minute window in where that node is going, to sp is going to wait for you to send this information. So if someone else offers this information to the node, then all the those requests are going to be queued. And if you end up not delivering, then they may like, request this information to someone else. Okay? Have this in mind, because this is going to be like, pretty important later on in, in our technique. And then finally, if everything goes right, the transaction is going to be delivered from uh, the sender to the destination. right? And that's like, how the whole propagation kicks off. Great. So now, in terms of orphan transactions, these are uh, kind of like spe special transactions in the sense that, um, well, let's, let's see exactly how it goes. So the, what goes with uh, orphan transactions is basically that the node that receives them is missing some information. So an orphan transaction and a transaction can be orphan for some nodes, but not orphan for other nodes. It basically goes as the picture says. So imagine that you have three transactions, transaction B, transaction D, C, and transaction D. And your node knows about transaction B, but then suddenly it receives transaction D. Transaction D is spending from a certain transaction C, or for the UTXOs actually of that created in that transaction, that your node doesn't know about. So since you cannot validate this kind of transaction because you're missing some information, instead of putting this transaction in the, mem in the mempool, what you're going to do is like flag it as orphan and put it in a different data structure, which is known as map orphan transactions or orphan pool. Um, and you're not going to forward this transaction to anyone, right? So if you don't know if the transaction is valid, there's no point of forwarding this transaction. You shouldn't relate. Um, and there's a, a quite important thing here that is that if someone asks you about this, offers you this transaction, so you have it in, in, the, in your orphan pool, and someone tells you like, hey, I want to offer you this transaction, you're not going to reply back, right? And that, again, is going to be important later on uh, for our technique to infer uh, the topology of the network. So finally, we have all the spending transactions. These are way better known uh, by, uh, by everyone, so I'm not going to like spend much time here. The only thing I think is important here is what's the policy of acceptance for double spending transactions. So if your node receives two transactions trying to spend from the same source, what he's going to do is accept the first one, but reject any subsequent one. Right? So it's like you get whatever you get first, and then if anything else is trying to spend from the same source, you just reject it. Great. So with that, we have like all we need to build a basic inferring uh, technique based on, uh, on transactions. We're going to be using two nodes, Alice and Bob. Three transactions that look as follows. We have uh, the parent transaction and the float transaction that are double spending transactions. And then we have the market transaction, which is spent from the parent. And that one is only going to be seen by some nodes as orphan and by other nodes as not. We'll see how that goes uh, in a second. And finally, we need an observation tool. In this case, we're using CoinScope. Uh, but you can see this as a node that is able to connect to like, as many nodes uh, in the network as he wants. Right? So like, basically like a super node in that sense. So how can we check if an, uh, an edge exists between two nodes? That's pretty straightforward. The only thing we have to do is, first, we connect to uh, the both of them. And we start sending transactions. We send, well, Sorry, let's assume that the pools are empty for now, just like to, to make it easier for, uh, for the, the examples. It doesn't matter that much, actually. So what we do is we send the parent and the flood to Alice and Bob. They may store that information in, um, in their mempool. So let's assume for now, too, that those transactions get to them at the same point. We can argue about that later on, but for now, just for simplicity, let's assume that. And then if at some point they try to exchange those transactions, this is going to fail. Right? Basically, because since they are double spending transactions, every single one of them is going to reject the other. 
Then if later on we send the marker to, to Alice, who has the parent, that transaction is going to be a valid transaction stored in, in mempool. And at some point, uh, she is going to try to send this transaction to Bob. But Bob doesn't have the parent, right? So Bob is missing some of the outputs that are required to validate this transaction. So basically, he is going to store this information in the in map on transaction pool. Great. Let's see how it goes in the, other, uh, in the other example. So now there's no link between Alice and Bob, and we are trying to do exactly the same. We send the parent and the flood. There's no communication between the two nodes because there's no link. Then we send the marker. The marker gets to, to Alice mempool, and that's basically it, right? So how can we distinguish between these two, uh, these two cases? The only thing we have to do is actually request back uh, the marker transaction from Bob. So we send an int message uh, to Bob offering that, and then what he's going to do is either ask us back about the transaction. So we offer it, you like ask back, but that means that you don't know it. So if you're requesting it back, you haven't seen that transaction before. So there's no edge. Or on the other hand, he may not reply. If he doesn't reply, that means that he already knows about the transaction, but we have only sent this transaction to Alice, right? So that means that there's an edge in there. So yeah, that's it, right? Easy peasy. Well, as some of you may have uh, been thinking already, this, is, uh, this works with when there are like two nodes in here because it's like a really simple example, but Actually, this is going to fail if we try to add a third node into the equation. Let's see why. So basically, we are going like, to repeat the exact same thing with Charlie now here, right? Same thing, empty pools, and we start doing this. Um, so we send the parent to Alice and the flood to, uh, to Bob. In this case, we're going to assume that uh, Alice forwards the transaction first. It doesn't matter that much. I have like, some examples later on with this uh, in the other side. So if you're interested, we, we can check it. But I mean, I cannot cover like, all the examples we're going to solve. So let's say that that's how it goes. Um, Alice forgot this transaction to, uh, to Charlie. Charlie stores it in, in mempool. Then at some point, we send the marker. The marker goes to Alice and is stored in mempool. And this is going to be forwarded later on and go to Charlie. right? Charlie has the parent, so that means that uh, the marker is also going to stay in mempool. And at some point, that's going to be forwarded to Bob. And since Bob doesn't have the parent, Bob is going to store it in the mobile phone transaction pool. Right. So what had happened now? The marker is in Bob's orphan transaction pool, which in the, in the previous example meant that Alice and Bob were connected. But now they are not. There's like an edge, uh, there's like a, a node between them, right? So we may think that there's an edge, a uh, di direct edge between Alice and Bob, and we may be wrong. So how can we make this work at scale? What was the problem in there? Actually, there are like three main properties we have to achieve in order to make this work in a network like Bitcoin, right? We don't have two nodes. We have like thousands of them. So the first one is isolation. What we want to achieve with, iso with isolation is that when we send a parent transaction to a node, we want to make sure that that transaction stays within that node and only that node. Then we have the synchrony uh, uh, property, which is exactly what I was trying to avoid before. But basically, it's like when I send two transactions to two different nodes and those transactions are double spending transactions, I want them to get there exactly at the same time. Because if I don't, then they may exchange information that I don't want them to exchange, and my experiment may, may break at some point. right? And finally, we want efficiency. How can we make this work in a network like Bitcoin with like 10K nodes or so uh, without having to spend too much money, right? So for this talk, I'm going to focus on the two first, uh, and I'm going to like about the, the last one. If you're interested in it, uh, the paper is out there with all the information, and you can catch me uh, up later, and I can explain it to you too. So what was the main problem here? What uh, made like, the whole thing break? So the problem was that the parent transaction uh, was forwarded by Alice, and we want that transaction to stay within it, right? Uh, that was what like, kicked, uh, kicked off like, the whole propagation of the marker later. So what happened here is the exact same three-step protocol we were talking about before. Alice offered this transaction to Charlie. Charlie requested back, and then Alice sent the transaction. So how, how can we avoid this? Well, basically, the problem was the, the inf message. If we can avoid Alice, if we can prevent Alice to send this inf message, then the whole three-step program is ne never going to be kicked, and then the transaction is never going to get sent, right? But the problem is that we don't control Alice. Alice is, some, is someone else. So how can we do this kind of thing? How can we prevent someone to send a transaction if that's not our node? Well, actually, it turns out that there's a technique called inf blocking. 
uh, that we can use uh, for, for this purpose. So, how does this work? Basically, what we will do, let's assume now that we are connected to all, um, is to send a uh, message with the transaction we want to block the propagation to, to all the network, right? We send this, and then by doing this, we are gonna kick that like two minute window I was talking about before. So every single node in the network, these three nodes here now in, in the example, are gonna request this information to me. And they're gonna wait until I send it for like a two minute window, right? So as long as, as I stay within this two minute window, the isolation and the synchrony problem, uh, the singly uh, uh, properties are not a problem anymore. I can like, start like, sending transactions to anyone else, and then they're gonna requ request this information to me and never gonna share this information. So we have like two minutes to run one of the rounds of our analysis and then start all over again. So let's see how this works in a simplified way with the in-blocking technique on. So we have the timer there, everyone is requesting this information to us, and we start sending this again, right? The parent goes to Alice, that goes to the mempool. Uh, the parent goes to Charlie now. Charlie stores, uh, sorry, Charlie is gonna request this for, uh, for us, from us, so he is not gonna accept this information from, from Alice. Then we send the flood to Bob, that goes to mempool. This gets propagated at some point, it goes to um, uh, Charlie's mempool. Then at some point, they may try to exchange this information, but that's gonna fail because the parent and the flood are double spending, so that, that doesn't go through. Then at some point we send the marker, the marker goes to Alice, goes to Mempool, it's shared to Carol, Carol puts it in the orphan transaction pool, as I was, and as I was saying at the beginning, this is not propagated further away. So if we now check who has the marker, we can like see when, where there's an edge, like from Alice and Carol, and where there's no edge, like from Alice and Bob, right? So that's all we need to like make this work at sale. So what's an overview of this protocol? What we do, like, basically, is first to choose the, the target node. Uh, later, oh, sorry. Later, we create the parent, the marker, and the flood transactions. We in-block the whole network with the parent. We send the block to every node but the, the target, and we let it propagate, right? We may, there may be some nodes in the network we are not connected to, and we don't want the parent to go to them, so we let the flood propagate, so everyone has, like, that double spending transaction. Then, at some point, we send the parent, we send the marker, let the marker propagate, and request the marker back from all the nodes we're connected to. And then basically we do this for like every single uh, node in the network, right? We keep rotating our, our, uh, our target and like we, we do it until we have covered the whole network. So, what's the cost estimation of uh, an analysis like this? So if we want to run this on mainnet, we will need, uh, we're like 10K nodes, more or less. We will need around eight hours, eight to nine hours to, to run it. And the cost of that in terms of money will be between 20 and $3 in terms of fees, right? The cool thing about this is that this can be reduced quite a lot because you actually don't care if your transactions end up being included in a block or not. The only thing you want are your transactions to be propagated through the network. So if you're able to find the sweet spot between full propagation and not inclusion, then you're actually doing this almost for free. Right? We actually, I mean, this is not even like optimized to be like that. Uh, you'll see later, later why, but that, this is just like paying basic relay, uh, relay fees. Then in terms of data validation, we didn't run this on mainnet, uh, we run it on testnet. Um, and in order to do this experiment, we use five ground truth nodes running Bitcoin D. And what we were trying to do was like to uh, infer the connections of those five nodes, and that's where our position on the call, call, call comes from, without actually like checking uh, what those nodes were connected to. So over 40 trials as, and with a 95% confidence, we got 100% precision and around 94, 95% uh, recall for the analysis. So yeah, we built some nice graphs out of it uh, from testnet. Here you have one. Um, basically you can see like here some nodes with some size and some color. And what this uh, represents is the size represents the degree. So the, the bigger the node, the, the bigger the, he, the, the more nodes he is connected to. And the color is basically community unfolding. So what we could see here was that uh, the community structure and the modularity of the nodes of the graphs we were getting was actually way higher than the ones expected for random graphs with uh, similar properties. Unfortunately, we cannot like extrapolate this to mainnet because the incentives of running like testnet nodes and mainnet nodes may be like completely different, right? 
And we decided not to run this analysis on mainnet because we were not sure like, to what extent uh, the propagation of normal transactions can be affected by an, an analysis. The thing is that I haven't talked that much about like, the whole cost uh, minimization, but there's where like, the whole messing up around with the network comes from. So basically, we empty the orphan transaction pool of every node for every single run of the analysis, uh, and that can affect normal transaction propagation. So since we didn't want to like, mess around with the, pro with the real network, we end up deciding not to do it. Uh, so yeah, I would like to conclude with like, the fixes uh, that were um, de derived from the analysis, from, from this kind of analysis. There's basically three pull requests merge to fix this kind of like, analysis or attack, depending on how you want to, to say it. The first one uh, by Peter Willy was this uh, set of orphan transactions in an actual random way. So the problem uh, th that was in there, and that comes again from the, la the whole like cost minimization, is that when they were like um, evicting information from the orphan transaction pool, they were not doing it in an, in an actual random way. So we were taking advantage of that to be able to like put as m many transactions as we wanted in, in the pool and kick out the rest, right? So basically, we fool the orphan transaction pool with our transactions. We kick all the transaction transactions out, and then we have like some some time to play with. Again, if you're really interested in this, we can like um, catch up offline. Then the second one is randomizing the get data, and that's uh, related with the in blocking. So the whole point was like, if I'm sending like an in message to you and you have haven't started the connection uh, with me, then that means that you can actually be targeted uh, be, be targeted for this kind of uh, of attacks. So what they are doing with this pull request is they um, prioritize uh, inf message from connections you have created, which are supposed to be randomly uh, selected. And then finally, we have uh, this last pull request that was created not that long ago, uh, that it's adding two additional connections uh, for every single node that are gonna only be block, uh, for block propagation, right? So those, uh, those two connections are gonna be like, um, out of like this kind of attacks, by, the, by default, right? Because you're not gonna be able to like send uh, transactions uh, through them. So, uh, the first one was already included in Bitcoin Core 0.18, and the two later, later are gonna be included in Bitcoin Core uh, 0.19. If you want more information about this, uh, you can like check that Bitcoin Ops uh, newsletter from, that was like September, I think, yeah, September. Uh, David really did a great job explaining like what were the fixes, so um, hat tip to them. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, if you like want to have like links for like the white, uh, the, the paper or like uh, the slides are all in my Twitter account. So like feel free to ping me. I can like send you all the information, catch me offline. And I think we have like a couple of minutes for questions. So yeah, that's all. Yes. the mempool of in the testnet, which is the reason you didn't do this on mainnet, mm -hmm. right? How exactly did you do that again? And I think you also said that was one of the things that was fixed, but what was the technique to do that? Yes, so I actually have uh, some extra slides for that. So, yeah, um, no, wait a second. I mean, that's like the part I haven't explained actually. So it's the efficiency part, right? So basically what we did for that is like, the examples I've been, I've been showing you, right, are using one orphan transaction all the time, right? But that's not efficient whatsoever. So uh, the orphan transaction pool is a, a structure that has 100 transaction size, right? So instead of like sending one orphan transaction at a time, what we can do is like send it in, in bundles of 100 transactions. And instead of having like one target node, we can have a target set, right? So we choose like 100 nodes, uh, every orphan is, uh, targets like one node, and then we see like how different parents like uh, are how different markets from different parents are propagated, and so on and so forth. Right. So the cool thing about this is that when they were evicting this information from the network, um, they were doing it based on the hash of the transaction. Right. So I think yeah, I have it here. So uh, basically, what they did was like from the they picked a random hash, a random value like uh, in the space of like the SHA-256, so like a 256 uh, hex value. And then they picked the transaction in the pool that was closer to that uh, random value. The problem with this kind of approach, instead of like just uh, looking for a random position and evic evicting that transaction, is that the transaction IDs can be forged, right? 
I mean, they're the, the double SHA-256 of the, of the transaction, but I can actually like, resign the transaction or like, change whatever I want in the transaction to make it look like exactly as I want it. So what we did with like, all these orphan transactions was to do like, a proof-of-work-ish approach in where we were creating the transaction until the hash was below a certain threshold. And then we were sure that our transactions were not going to be like um, uniformly distributedly picked because the hash was not uniformly distributed, right? So yeah, that's that's basically how it worked. Basically, what they are doing now is like uh, choosing it not based on a random hash, but like on a random position, like yeah. Oh yeah, and that's like how we do it. Instead of like having one, we have like multiple of them. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I had like more data. I didn't even remember I had like that much. Um, any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>